Hello and welcome to today's webinar, number two in a series in which we are giving you a deep dive into the five stages of becoming agile and data-driven. I'm Rich Colgard, publisher of Forbes magazine, where I write a featured column called Innovation Rules. It is my pleasure to be hosting our presentation today. Now before we begin, I would like to quickly bring to your attention a couple of areas in the webinar council. Number one, there is a Q&A module. I encourage you to ask questions as they come to mind throughout the presentation. We will address these questions at the close of the presentation. Also take a look at the icons at the bottom of your screen uh, to explore later. First is a resource links icon, which will let you download today's presentation and other relevant materials. Second, the share icons will allow you to send the presentation to a friend or to push via social media. Finally, there is a help button for assistance with any technical difficulties you might experience. Please hit F5 to refresh your council as a first step. Now, I would like to introduce you to today's featured speakers. Mohan Sani is a professor of technology and the director of the Center for Research in Technology at Northwestern University's Kellogg School of Management. He is a globally recognized scholar, teacher, consultant, and speaker in business innovation, modern marketing, and new media. He has written six books and dozens of influential articles. Mohan has advised many of the leading technology companies as well as technology startups. He has been widely recognized as a thought leader. Business Week named Mohan as one of the 25 most influential people in e-business. Oliver Ratzesberger is the president of Teradata Labs, Teradata's innovation engine. He provides visionary direction for all research and development and sales support activities related to Teradata's integrated data warehousing, big data analytics, and associated solutions. He oversees a talented pool of more than 1,400 technologists located in Silicon Valley, Southern California, Toronto, and other global locations. As president of Teradata Labs, he reports to Herman Wimmer, co-president of Teradata. And you might know that before Teradata, Oliver led big data projects at eBay. Mohan and Oliver, welcome and thank you back. Uh, thank you for participating today. I'd like to start by asking you to pick up on your discussion from our last webinar on the sentient enterprise vision. So give us an overview of what you mean by the sentient enterprise and, and, uh, and take it from there. Thank you, Rich, and uh, good morning, uh, folks. Uh, this is Mohan, and uh, welcome to the second series um, of, of this webinar. So um, the whole concept that we were talking about really arose out of our reflection on what is the future of analytics capabilities in the enterprise. And the problem that we uh, became aware of or began to think about was that the pace at which data is coming into the enterprise and needs to be processed in the enterprise requires a fundamental rethink in the way that enterprises listen to data, process it, and make decisions. And we felt that the only way to deal with the increasing scale of data and the, and the customer needs to basically get real-time information was a very high level of automation. And this automation would have to reach to the level that an enterprise would be able to do essentially straight through processing where you start by listening to the, to the data, processing it through automated algorithms and actually doing autonomous decisioning. So in this context, what we realized was that what we have is a vision of an enterprise that does autonomous decisioning at scale in real time. And as you think about this ability to sense and respond at scale in real time, the enterprise starts to look almost like a sentient organism, and hence the concept of the sentient enterprise. So the sentient enterprise, very briefly, is an organization that is able to ingest process and, you know, and act upon and make decisions uh, virtually autonomously for a significant percentage of the decisions that it does need to make. So that's the North Star, that's the vision towards which we are driving. And obviously this represents an ideal state, much like Six Sigma represented an ideal state in quality or the real-time enterprise or the just-in-time 
inventory represented real, you know, ideal states in terms of the latency and uh, inventory. So we don't think that any enterprise is has reached that stage today or will in the near future. However, it's a very useful north star towards which to drive. So that's the vision, but there are many steps on the way. And what we are here to talk to you about is a capability maturity model that steps through various stages in this evolutionary process. And uh, to describe that and further, I'm going to hand it over to Oliver. Hey, thanks, Mohan. Yeah, just, just, just uh, uh, a couple more uh, words to this here. Uh, we, we, as, as we started discussing this uh, uh, over the past two years, uh, and as we look back at experiences that some of us has, have had at very large scale implementations of data, uh, uh, we started realizing that a, a lot of that is cultural, a lot of that is process, a lot of that is people, uh, and that uh, we will really need to talk about capabilities that organizations have to build in order to be successful and thought leaders with data. Um, it doesn't, it doesn't help just to buy great technology if you cannot implement uh, uh, the technology at scale in the enterprise. And, and, and we have learned over the years that the, the actual cultural shift required to become a leader in analytics and, and data is probably the hardest part, not installing new, new technology or running new software. And so with that, with that uh, uh, we set forth and, and we built this, this, this concept of sentient enterprise uh, and um, wanted to take you through some of the more detailed steps of what we think these individual uh, maturity steps and capabilities have to look like. Well, piece the puzzle together for us. What is the, uh, how do you start? What is the five-step process for, for beginning um, the sentient enterprise methodology? Uh, th this, is a, this is a great question. So in order to uh, answer that, uh, 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 that question, we built a five-stage uh, majority model that uh, allows us to describe what the capabilities are that are required in order to reach that, that goal of the sentient enterprise. Let me quickly take you through an overview and then we'll drill into some of the details. Uh, it first starts out with agility. Uh, stage one is really about how do enterprises become agile around data. Uh, and, and this is a really core fundamental capability. I know that a lot of companies around the world are really actively uh, searching for that capability or looking or, or, or attempting to implement that. But in many cases, we see uh, uh, enterprises fall for the more the wild, wild west or the, you know, we stop documentation, we stop architecture, and we call that agile. And agile is, however, something that is way more difficult and way more complicated. And, and agile needs to be, first of all, uh, it needs to be based on, on, on an agile methodology. It requires people to be trained on that. It requires also a lot of automation that allows people to work in that agile environment and not forego things like governance or repeatability. Uh, because if you build agility on the false premises and fall for the wild, wild west, and you build a card house, then yes, it might work well for an individual department for 30, 60, 90 days, but a year into it or two years into it, it's usually that card house that if you pull the wrong card, everything starts falling together. So agility, very, very big part, and we'll talk a little bit about what tools are needed to do that. Uh, the second stage is what we call the behavioral data platform, and that's really uh, again, don't, don't think of systems here. Don't think of what kind of boxes do I need to install to do uh, behavioral data, but focus on what's the change in a company when the shift happens from transactional to behavioral data. Transactional thinking is how many products did I sell or ship or deploy on Monday versus last Monday versus last month versus last year, right? Behavioral thinking all of a sudden looks at very different patterns and all of a sudden algorithms and patterns are starting to become the lead. Experimentation platforms are leading the way with using data. And it's a very different way to think about data and it requires 
uh, uh, new technologies, but it even more so requires new thinking uh, that spans the entire organization, uh, the CFO, the CEO, uh, the individual uh, the, uh, uh, business units, as well as technology, on how to go about uh, behavioral uh, uh, thinking. Uh, the, uh, level three of the, of the sentient enterprise is what we call the collaborative ideation platform. This is all about this is all about crowdsourcing and collaboration within the organization. Uh, as you become more agile, as you produce more uh, 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 prototypes, as you uh, uh, apply concepts like fail fast and move into experimentation platforms and behavioral data, all of a sudden traditional structures like metadata or like let me ask my colleague to find out what data to use for a certain uh, analysis don't scale anymore, especially for a large-scale enterprise. And this is really where we think the concept of a LinkedIn for analytics, a, a crowdsourced collaboration platform within the enterprise is absolutely key. We have to learn from each other. We have to have the ability to see what others are doing within the company and learn from that. Uh, and, 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 if, and, and, and when we onboard new people, we need the ability to, uh, to, 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 to tap into that corporate knowledge and make that uh, accessible and shareable. Uh, stage four is what we call the analytical application platform. This is all about how to bring app, app economy and scale and cloud and DevOps into analytics and into the enterprise. Uh, we can no longer afford to wait for a centralized team of ETL developers or whatnot to bring us new data. We need the ability to really uh, build applications and apps similar to what we see on our smartphones where very, uh, uh, very uh, 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 young people, for example, are able to publish applications that reach hundreds of thousands of, of devices within days. Uh, it's also about enterprise listening. Uh, we can no longer afford to do data integration after the fact all the time. Uh, this is not to say that ETL goes away, but we need something that complements uh, ETL, and, and we talk about the concept of data listening and how that is important for the enterprise. And ultimately, that leads us to stage five, which is autonomous decisioning platform. Here we talk algorithm. Here we talk predictive technologies at scale. This is not how to predict a churn event for an individual customer. This is about signal detection at scale across all KPIs, all data, all dimensions, all during drill downs, because as we grow as an organization, we usually build so many dashboards and drill downs and visualizations and algorithms and outcomes that we don't have enough human beings and enough eyeballs on all the data to see change happen in front of us. And once we have looked at the same visualization 10 days in a row and nothing had changed, we stopped looking at it and chances are right then change happens. And so this is where algorithms need to help us scale beyond where we are today. You know, I just want to add um, a little flavor to this uh, to highlight some of the, uh, the the trends and themes that we are also incorporating from what we see happening around us. For instance, behavioral profiling, um, you know, as, as and collaborative filtering, and these these technology have been used by e-commerce vendors now for a while. So that's sort of in in stage two is incorporation of the best practice of really looking at behaviors rather than transactions to provide more context around the transaction. When we look at stage three, the collaborative ideation platform, there we are incorporating the idea of crowdsourcing and applying that to analytics. So uh, you, and, and, and applying, because here the notion is that by applying the wisdom of crowds and the power of crowdsourcing, you allow um, the decision-making process to scale. And similarly, when we get to step four, the analytical application platform, that is incorporating the idea of the app economy um, and, and, and the idea of self-service, zero support, and zero setup applications uh, that now come into the enterprise. And, and finally, on the autonomous decisioning, also we are drawing from ideas such as automated trading and driverless cars and uh, you know, autonomous driving. So uh, another way to think about this, this framework is it actually incorporates many of the, uh, the insights and best practices that we see around us in the world of data, in the world of algorithms, and in the world of crowdsourcing. Well, this, uh, this, it really is a great North Star, and for any company to be successful in the future, they're going to have to become 
a living organism to be fast and agile enough. But let's start with the building foundation. What is the Agile Data Warehouse? Uh, this is a great question. How do, how do you become agile if you, if, 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 if you have focused on building systems like data warehouses for the last 10 or, or 20 years? Uh, 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 and uh, the biggest thing that we have learned in the early 2000s was that the, the rigor we have applied, the, the processes we have applied, the fact that we have used best practice out of software development and product, uh, product development that all start with a requirements document has driven away users from, from these platforms, right? And all of a sudden you see uh, 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 data marts and, and silos of data pop up within the organization. I cannot wait uh, 18 months uh, to get data. I need something in 30, 60, 90 days. Just give me all the data. Let me work with it. And the default solution was quite often, you know, I'll create my own silo of data. I create a copy of data, and the problem starts there. When when agility or the, 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 the search for agility really turns into uh, much more of a wild, wild west. The first thing that we have developed was the concept of we need sandboxes. Uh, we initially called them virtual data marts, called them sandboxes, called them data labs, where we built a self-service capability that says, you know, anybody that comes uh, 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 to the website that says, I need my own sandbox, we have a five-minute SLA where it automatically provisions a sandbox. However, the important part here is this is not just yet another instance of, of whatever your preferred uh, platform file system database is, uh, because the important part is uh, once you open up your sandbox, all the data that the, the, the corporation has available needs to be there. Uh, and so we built out an infrastructure that said, uh, the moment you open up your sandbox, not only do you have empty space for your experiments, for your prototypes, for your fail fast uh, uh, methodologies, but all the data that is there from the customer, from the product, needs to be there, no need to create copies. And that was a really, really big first in initial step that we had to build because we had to enable uh, people with a underlying platform that allowed us to uh, 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 create a, a platform where new technologies allow us to quickly move and iterate, uh, put governance underneath it, put concepts like uh, a time boxing uh, into this, uh, uh, but also at the same point in time capture exactly what people are doing with data or to en enable concepts like analytics on analytics, which is a very important concept once you go into self-service and, uh, and, and, uh, and uh, uh, data labs because the moment you open up self-service self and the talk access to data, you really need to understand what people are doing in order to then at some point in time take any sort of prototype and quickly turn it into a production uh, uh, application or a production feature. And so having a replay button, uh, so to speak, for any one of these sandboxes to say, we know exactly what you have done over the last four weeks with this, turning this into production, we now have a speedboat methodology that allows us to move that in four to six weeks into a production ready uh, uh, application is really critical. So making that shift from traditional waterfall to an agile methodology that's empowered by tools like uh, data labs, but also by new capabilities, for example, like what we have learned from uh, 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 cloud uh, over the last, and e-commerce over the last 10 to 15 years, uh, capabilities like driverless environments, right? RESTful APIs. Uh, all of a sudden, it's very important to reach a lot of developers and a lot of uh, uh, analysts within the company without having them go through uh, more installs of more software, right? Uh, the access to a data lab needs to be inherent and needs to be from every browser within the company. It shouldn't require specialized software. It can't take a setup where I need to open a ticket with IT because the moment I have to wait for a ticket and there's an SLA of three to seven days, I can no longer be agile. What we are trying to accomplish here is what used to take, uh, to take days, weeks, or months need to now happen in hours or days, right? I have an idea with data on Monday morning. I need to be able in the afternoon to have that data in my data lab, right, combine it with all the data that sits within the company, 
and ultimately, ultimately be able to manage that through an infrastructure that allows a company to scale at that and where we can train people on agility, but then we give them the tools not to get stuck in the traditional processes that make it very difficult in, in traditional organizations to do that. And so the Agile Data Platform needs to have these concepts of data labs. It needs to have concepts like driverless, restful interfaces that you can talk to these data labs, uh, uh, tools and utilities that makes it very easy for a business analyst to load their own data in addition to what they have. They might have done a study with, with, with 10,000 customers. If now they want to see it against 100 million customers, what other customers are similar. This is usually a process that takes weeks and sometimes months in organizations, and it's something that an organization really needs to get down to hours and days so that within a week, within a sprint of a scrum uh, 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 um, cycle, you can actually make progress and bring data in. in, in, in it's really critical, and, and of, of course, uh, along those lines go concepts like layered data architecture, uh, and there's more details uh, behind that on how to decompose these problems that traditionally have led to very, very large projects. How do we build microservices? How do we land raw data as, as quickly as possible, but not forget about the lineage, right? How do we carry forward structure where structure ex ex exists, but uh, don't uh, don't force on structure where we don't have structure to begin with. This is where tightly coupled, loosely coupled, and non-coupled data needs to meet and come together and, and, and enable companies to really iterate very quickly on their uh, daily questions. Well, the next step uh, t to me seems uh, the really complicated one because you're dealing with humans, and that is the behavioral data platform. How is this different? from how businesses run their analytics today? Uh, this, this is a great question. Uh, uh, the behavioral data platform is all about making a shift as a company to move from transactional thinking to behavioral thinking and really to build out behaviors and experimentation platforms, for example, as a core foundation of how to measure what the business is doing, what individual customers or micro segments of customers or machines are doing and how they are different. Uh, and this applies, again, uh, in, in B2C companies, this applies on, uh, to customer data as well as it does to machine and sensor data, right? A, a gas turbine in the Sahara has very different uh, 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 behaviors than the same, uh, 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 the same machine in, in Greenland, right? And so it's all about behaviors and leveraging behaviors to see what is happening. And as such, the behavioral data platform really makes a shift from transactional thinking within the organization to behavioral thinking. And tra uh, traditionally, many of our companies are leveraging transactional data today to do typical BI, right? We look at how many products were sold on Monday versus last week versus last, uh, last year, and we are very focused on the transactions. Uh, it's not until companies start to evolve and start saying, you know what, um, the, the individual sale of a product, the individual transaction is an interesting outcome and is a behavior by itself, but there are so many more behaviors in between, right? Whether these are uh, for companies in e-commerce, whether it's clickstream data, whether that is call center data, whether that is social media, or in, in terms of machines, whether that is sensor data, right? Uh, in sensor, if you've ever looked at sensor data, sensor data is a very, very different animal than transactional data. But at the same point in time, Sensor data by itself has only so much use in the enterprise, you really have to tie it back to that transactional data in order to understand the bill of material that this uh, 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 sensor went into and understand the location of where this was installed and run. So same as, as, as we're looking for customer behaviors, all of a sudden the company needs to start thinking in patterns, right? It's no longer counting and counting an individual transaction, but it's looking at the different patterns that lead up to a transaction, right? Or that lead up to an event of significance for us. And yeah, of course, this is, on one side, it's an explosion of data, and we have seen it as we worked over that uh, uh, at places like eBay for myself. Uh, this is all of a sudden, let's deal with 100x more data, right? So clearly, scale, and, and, and this is where the term big data often comes in, but Big data to me is such an oversimplification. It's really about behavioral patterns that an organization starts to focus on and 
And that, while it might sound easy, is quite a cultural change for a company. The traditional uh, BI developer that builds uh, a dashboard and counts uh, a, a, a transactions or business analyst that leverages that data all of a sudden needs to look at paths over time, for example, right? What led to a purchase or what led to an upsell or what led to a broken machine, right? What are the indicators that we have before that and how do we stitch them together and how do we define them as a behavior that we now build platforms around in, in a behavior rather than uh, the individual transaction or the individual events that by themselves might have very limited uh, uh, um, uh, meaning or ability to, to act on. Well, yeah, I mean, just a quick comment. observation here that, uh, that, that, you know, as Oliver was saying, that, you know, behavioral data provides you the context around the transaction. A transaction may be an outcome of a lot of explanatory fa variables and factors. And, and, in, and, in, and the other observation I want to make is that the different types of behavioral data, when you combine them, they don't combine additively. The insights are actually exponential because then when you combine sensor data with location data, with transaction data, with clickstream data, with social data, you get a richer and richer tapestry and your ability to see the patterns becomes uh, richer and richer. So it's as you combine different forms and types of data uh, and look at the entire context, this gives you a much greater explanatory power and diagnostic ability uh, as opposed to just seeing what happened. You now know why why it happened and what led to it happening. Well, it's interesting when you talk about that because the you know almost the very definition of a, of a sentient being is is a being who has very complex pattern recognition skills. Uh, during the last webinar, you talked about a LinkedIn for analytics. Is this the foundation for what you call a collaborative ideation? Yeah, this is this is uh, this is exactly what it is. Uh, as we move from uh, from the stage where we become agile and where we work on agility at scale within the organization, and where we start enabling more and more user groups and business units. To, uh, to, to fail fast with data, to build prototypes very quickly, to start all of a sudden focusing on behaviors rather than on transactions, we start realizing that the more people we mix into this, into this uh, environment, the more difficult it becomes to ultimately know what is there, who is working on what, what data exists, what should I use to make a decision? And traditional metadata starts falling apart, right? Traditional uh, data models, metadata, descriptions, uh, your favorite wiki pages, or whatnot, all is no longer enough to bring an enterprise together. And, and, and uh, I think we started realizing that uh, around 2008, 2009, when we really started scaling out our capabilities, and all of a sudden we, 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 we dealt with, with petabytes of behavioral data. And we had hundreds and thousands of analysts around the world, and onboarding a new data scientist almost became an, a, 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 a year-long task, and it was very much built on, you need to know that analyst over there in this department, and you need to talk to these guys over there in Europe in order to understand what people are doing, and we started realizing that will no longer scale. We need, a, and we need to bring in concepts like crowdsourcing into the enterprise in order to allow people to search for what they need, to share what they're working on, to follow what other people are doing, to like output of somebody else. All of these are now events in a much larger graph that, that allows us to follow what are people doing within the organization, right? And so analytics about analytics is a big part here that, that needs to evolve. This is like we need to follow each and every single individual within the company, every behavioral model that is being built, every data visualization, every dashboard, every change to any one of these things so that we can see what is the most used knowledge within the organization? How can we share that with the rest of the organization? How can we get to a point where you can recommend to somebody where you can say, people that look at this data set 
usually combine it with these data sets. Or if you want to join this data with that, here's how people do that, right? And oh, by the way, somebody asked that question already today, and here's what the outcome was. Now, of course, security and governance and structure needs to be underneath of that. This cannot be a free for all, uh, uh, I have access to anything that I want if I don't have the security clearance. So it needs to be built on a, on a, on a safe foundation, it's very important. It also needs to be built with extreme concurrency and, 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 and enablement and ad hoc in mind because all of a sudden like I enable not just tens of users, we're talking to hundreds and thousands of, of individuals that all come to the same place to start getting the information. What we, what we started building out was a journey that we started back uh, probably around 2009, 2010 that we called the Data Hub, right? And it's in its original form, it was a very simple um, uh, one-stop shop, and this is, this is just a, a, a very simple stylized uh, form of what, what this could be. Uh, you need to think of it as a LinkedIn for analytics. You need to think of it as a place that people can come to search for information, uh, to get insights, to ask questions, uh, but based on what the rest of the organization is doing. And this is really where, uh, as I said before, analytics on analytics becomes very important. And it's a capability that I think every organization needs to develop. It was the time uh, when, when we hired uh, a chief data scientist whose job it was just to analyze the uh, analytical patterns of anybody else within the company in order for us to derive and share what people are doing. Uh, we enabled concepts like storytelling with data, which is very important. Too many times we have capabilities like um, uh, a, a visualization, uh, we use uh, BI tools, but they're all standalone. They cannot be integrated in workflows, and we, we really worked on how do we allow that to be, to be leveraged in storytelling, uh, place live interactive data in front of people, have them ask questions. When they ask questions, let other people, you know, reply to it. The typical uh, core or stack exchange uh, type of capability that allows people to self-help them, but also capabilities like building graphs uh, on how data is being used so that you can autocomplete things like requests like SQL statements, like reports that they're looking for, and also start merchandising data where you, say, you know, people in your network that look at customer data also combine it with the following other data sets. Really, really important capability. Well, at stage four, your business is becoming truly agile and sentient. Explain the analytical application platform. Um, the analytical application platform is really about bringing the app economy within, uh, within an organization. Uh, and it's something that, that I think is a, uh, this is where cloud, where DevOps, where zero cost deployment meets analytics, uh, collaboration, uh, uh, behavioral, and agile all in one place. Uh, if you are agile, if you find new insights, if you build behavioral models, if through collaboration you even get better and faster in finding them, if the outcome of, a, of an analysis or visualization ends up going into an email asking somebody to do something about it, you have already failed. Because too many times that then ends in broken processes or in non-implementation. Too many times I walk through uh, companies that have beautiful visualizations taped on the walls. And when you ask them, so what, what, what have you done about this? What is this cluster up there, right? It's like, yeah, we're working on that. Uh, we're waiting for somebody to make a change to a system. This is where we need to bring the app economy into the organization centered around analytics and data. How do we enable everybody within the company to build apps uh, in their whatever favorite environment, whether that is Python for, for data scientists or Java, JavaScript for web developers uh, or Scala or any of these languages that are out there. And how do we make it so that the individual business unit, the individual developer, the individual data scientist doesn't need to focus on the DevOps or the production aspects of how do I deploy this, but where they, where they really only have to focus on what is, um, what is the business logic? 
what is the what is the, the the algorithm or the model or the visualization that I want to attach to data and drive outcome to somewhere else? So build a platform that makes it very easy and repeatable. And again, we've learned over the years a lot from cloud and DevOps on how to build platforms that can. Um, enable continuous integration, continuous deployment, on how to build applications on top of microservices architectures where the individual developer does not have to think about, you know, what I'm going to do about deployment. Similar as if you think about uh, uh, app platforms in, 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 in the likes of, of, of smartphones, right? Uh, when, we, when we build an application, our interface is the App Store uh, uh, to present that application. That deployment is then built into every individual device. And that's where the analytical application platform ultimately needs to take us to. It's like, what's the containerization? What's this, the microservices architecture that needs to be built in order to build applications that now can take data and can be deployed in real time into the organization? It's a very important one that we have spent the last several years in various companies on. Um, it's something that 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 uh, is absolutely critical, and 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 a, a capability that an organization needs to develop uh, beyond going through the first three stages. It's also about data integration, and this is where we've learned over the years that traditional, you know, I have this centralized place, and I ask a team of ETL developers to find me the data after the fact. That that has an inherent um, uh, a problem for a lot of organizations uh, because in, in many organizations, new applications get deployed uh, on the operational side, right? Uh, and once we roll them out, once we turn them live to our customers or to the machines that, they're, that they operate, we then realize, oh, we need to analyze the data that they produce. What do we do? We send somebody from a centralized organization, from an you know, IT pool of ETL developers, and say, hey, here's the, here's the spec. The data that we need is in that system over there. Here's how the data is supposed to look like. Go get that data and integrate it for us. Uh, the problem starts right here where the ETL developer that we use has never seen that data, was not part of building or implementing that app, has no idea what the context of that data is, only is based, basing uh, his or her work on, on a specifications document of what the data is supposed to look like. And in many cases, we all know data looks different. Uh, there's other data in there than what is in documentation. And so that never quite scales. Uh, we have too many people requesting data, and so we need to change that model upside down. Now, this is not to say that ETL goes away, by no means, right? But we need to supplement it with a new capability. And uh, over the years, we, we came up with the concept of what we call a data listening platform. A data listening platform uh, 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 performs data integration in a very different way uh, compared to traditional ETL after the fact. A data listening platform leverages cloud-based services, RESTful infrastructure, DevOps, to allow people to uh, integrate data integration all the way up front at the, very, uh, at the very front of where these applications are being developed in the business, whether that's a call center application, whether that is a, 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 a controller for a uh, uh, for for a, a machine, a, a complex uh, a, a system, or whether it is simple things like clickstream analysis, right? How do we enable the organization to integrate data through self-service again? How can an individual developer that works, for example, on a new iPhone app for the business that helps uh, the, the customers of the business get data faster or perform transactions easier, how do we enable that development team to integrate their data in real time without having, again, specialized software, needing specialized uh, uh, tools somewhere in the back end? But how do we leverage RESTful, in uh, RESTful interfaces, API keys, and streams of data that can then be directed at the various systems and at the various sandboxes and data labs so that data can start flowing from the very first application into these, into these environments? Mohan? Yeah, so I, I think that this is, as you can see, what's going on here is that 
progressively as we are pro going through the stages, we are de-bottlenecking the process of analytics. And what has happened in the data listening framework is that the human processes involved in ETL are being replaced by this sort of automated process where you can essentially turn on a data feed, put it into a sandbox, and analyze it uh, all end-to-end -end straight through processing. Thank you. I love that phrase, Mohan, de-bottlenecking. I think you should, uh, I think you should uh, uh, copyright that. <laughs> uh, finally, step five of the methodology, what does the North Star look like? How does a business become truly agile and sentient? Um, this, is, this is ultimately where we get into the really interesting stage five. Uh, uh, and before I talk about uh, uh, what we need to do here and, 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 and have Mohan join in in this, in this really interesting description of what uh, stage five and ultimately what Ascension Enterprise is, uh, let me first give you an example of, of, a, of a problem that we have today in organizations. We leverage human beings to sift through data. What I mean with that is uh, the more you scale an organization around data, the more data you integrate at the various levels, whether it is tightly coupled, loosely coupled, or non-coupled data, the more output we create. Uh, you know, look at a, at a company that is really advancing rapidly and look at over three years, for example, where a company has come. Most likely you have hundreds of KPIs, you have hundreds of dimensions, hundreds of thousands of micro segments, uh, you have product categories, um, you, have, you have drill downs, you have algorithms that all produce outputs that do things that, that create visualizations. And as we scale that, we, we stop looking at certain data. Uh, or we build so many drill downs into the data from any visualization that we have that Yes, for a few days, any new visualization will get a lot of eyeballs to look at, a lot of excitement, and we, we find things and we do things about that. By the time that visualization stops changing on us or becomes known or stale, we stop looking at it, right? We move on to the next thing. That's usually when change happens, right? All of a sudden, like in one country, one product category be, uh, uh, starts to behave ever so slightly different. Well, if I have no eyeballs looking at that, and again, I've seen companies with 800 analysts around the world, uh, and all their combined brains and eyeballs missed uh, ongoing change all the time, and we started realizing we cannot throw more people at that problem. You know, we need to turn this 90% of time sifting through data around into how do we get ultimately people to spend 90% of their time in decision making. And that's a really, really complex and difficult problem, right? Because uh, today they have to look through visualizations. They have to look through uh, uh, drill downs and, 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 and the output of algorithms and, and it simply doesn't scale. So what do we need to do? What do we need to learn from? And, and it's, really the, it's really the age of algorithms and, and signal detection at scale, right? Uh, uh, there's companies today that are spending a lot of resources to build signal detection engines and algorithms, not for a particular use case, but for problems at scale. How can I build an algorithm that looks at all KPIs, at all behavioral models, at all self-service, and finds out what has changed since yesterday or since last week, and where the human being that goes to something like a data hub all of a sudden gets a list of like, here are the top three changes that the algorithms have detected. A human being should really look at that and make a decision whether or not these are changes that are relevant. And we can learn from algorithms at scale. I mean, this is, this is similar to what, uh, uh, what we're trying to solve with autonomous uh, 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 driving, right? Self-driving cars. It's all about algorithms. It's not about replacing the human being uh, because the human being needs to decide where to go, but it's taking the mundane tasks and making them safer and making them more efficient. All of you that have driven in a car with a, uh, a, a, a adaptive cruise control uh, have probably experienced the fact that these cars, even though they're not completely self-driving, they break faster than they, that you can in any moment. They can be, keep a better safe distance to the cars in front of you. And by the way, they don't get distracted by an accident on the side of the road, right? And so it's where algorithms really come in to help us 
um, support human beings and, and find this. And it, it's, it, it's in, in, in the financial industry, automated trading has been a world of algorithms for, uh, for many years now. And it's about all about how do we train algorithms to ultimately support decision making at scale. And, and, and an organization, an enterprise, really needs to bring that ultimately into the organization in order to deal with the potentially millions or billions of intersections of data and, 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 and highlight to us human beings, you know, what are the next big things that we should focus on and we should be looking at. Yeah, in fact, that's a, and then that's a key point, you know, going back to the driverless car analogy, you know, what, what the automated, actually technically, you know, we call these ADAS, which is automated driver assistance systems. I think that's an important insight that this complementing human decision making, not really substituting because it's freeing up the human being from making the, doing making the mundane decisions and and actually the algorithm is able to do it much better it can look at the distance in the car in front of you 60 times a minute uh, or multiple times a second uh, while a human being is much slower to respond but it frees up the human being to do the higher order tasks and the higher order decisions so similarly what algorithms uh, uh, will do in the enterprise is they will surface for the human beings the patterns and the the interpretations and the, the analysis that really needs to be done. So while millions of calculations may be being done, the patterns that emerge, the three key insights that emerge, the algorithm will surface those so that we can make the decisions at the higher level. So we should think about these as sort of a hierarchy of decisions, decisions that need to be delegated to algorithms and decisions that need to be surfaced for the analyst uh, or the human being. And that's the way we deal with the fundamental problem of the volume of data and the speed of decision making and deep bottlenecking. So it's really kind of how human beings and algorithms will work together in order to solve this problem of making decisions in real time at scale. And I think okay, that's really the summary of what we are talking about, that at the end of the day, you know, when uh, so to summarize what the sentient enterprise is able to do, it has certain fundamental capabilities. It is evolving. It is learning constantly, and it's you know getting the algorithm is getting smarter over time. It is you know it it it, it makes decisions at scale, uh, and it makes decisions in 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 real time. So so as you start to think about the capabilities of the Sentient Enterprise, it starts to approximate what we've talked about, which is the, the company as a single organism. And, uh, and, and again, you know, I'll repeat what we said earlier. This is a, an ideal state to strive towards, and I hope we've given you a roadmap for where this is all headed. Well, thank you both. Uh, we have a ton of questions pouring in, and I want to get to as many as possible. Uh, the first one, there are so many choices of data management analytics technologies out there today. How do you choose the right ones in building the Agile data warehouse and the foundations of a layered data architecture? Uh, that's, a, that's a great question. I, and I think that is something that um, I, I've seen in my, in my own you know, career over the last 15, 20 years. Uh, uh, we have, as a, I think as an industry, we have created so many choices. There are so many, uh, so many capabilities out there, uh, technical systems, right? Uh, mm -hmm. so, 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 much, so many uh, options on, on what to choose. And it's something that an organization really needs to get their, arm, uh, uh, their arms around because if you just start going for yet another new system, yet another new capability, and you keep iterating purely on, uh, on technologies and, and let's try uh, whatever the latest uh, new capabilities, you need to balance that with, ultimately you need to build a platform that's re repeatable, right? You need at some point in time to make technology choices that say, can I scale, can I scale uh, agility in the organization? And wh what do I need for that? Well, Ultimately, in order to be agile, I need platforms that allow me to combine production and non-production uh, 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 use cases on the very same platform. I need the ability that users can ask ad hoc questions, can run fast, uh, fail fast uh, prototypes in parallel to the most critical SLA applications running in the, in, in, the, in the company. And it needs to be a, a platform that supports that, that 
that, that, that enables uh, 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 even bad requests, right, not to impact the system. It cannot be that uh, just because an unexperienced business user asks uh, too big of a question and forgets to, to, to limit the amount of data that is being processed, it cannot be that other processes in the, in the organization or SLA starts to suffer. At the same point in time, you need to really think about uh, how can I deal with that level of concurrency that I need, for example, right? This is not 10 users in the company that will come up with agile projects. How do I support hundreds or thousands? And the platforms that enable that need to enable very high concurrency for very, very large processing, right? It can't be that I can only run 10 or 15 or 20 jobs at a time. I need platforms that can run hundreds or thousands of jobs at scale against all that. Because if you don't, then you are forced into the silos. Then you have to say, well, my, my technology right now can only support uh, 10 to 20 uh, uh, users at a time. I have hundreds or thousands, therefore I need dozens or hundreds of, of copies of data. And, and then you get into the problem of data drift. Then you get into the problem of like more and more overhead gets, uh, uh, gets created by just copying the same data around and keeping it in sync. And so scale is, is, is key. Concurrency is absolutely key. Workload management is a must-have. You must be able to, to, to run the wildest ad hoc new ideas in parallel to highly critical uh, production workloads. So I hope that gives you a little bit of a, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a framework of what types of technologies ultimately you need to choose in order to be successful with agility because uh, agility sounds like, oh, I just train a team on Scrum. And while that is important, or any other agile methodology, the underlying platforms need to support that at scale, right? It can't be that you need to build them a platform one team at a time, because the overhead will simply not scale. We have quite a number of questions around the HR question um, as it applies to Ascension organization and how to build one. Number one is what, what are the types of people skills should companies look to hire to move them along to this path? And number two, how do you prepare the culture that you already have or shift the culture that you already have to get people ready for this? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about the first one, and, and maybe Oliver can uh, respond to the other question. So the, in terms of, uh, terms of skill sets, I'll say that there's actually three, three levels to which I, I think about uh, a change in an organization. It's mindset, skill set, and tool set, and this is a hierarchy. So the first thing that needs to change is the mindset, and the mindset that needs to change is, you know, from is 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 the mindset of transactional data, centralized data warehouses, and the waterfall methodology. So I think that the first that that the embracing of agility, agility both in terms of the uh, the the decision making process, but also in the data warehouse, is something that's really important from a mindset standpoint. And that then translates into the skill sets that people need to build. I think the skill sets, again, the culture of experimentation, the idea of self-service, the idea of sort of uh, really making, uh, you know, uh, running experiments quickly, building sandboxes, and creating a culture of agile experimentation is, is, is important. And then the tool sets we've talked about in terms of the platforms and capabilities you need to build. So, uh, so and, and specifically in terms of skills, really, I think that there is, no such thing as a, an ideal data scientist. I mean, it's really a hybrid because the ideal data scientist that we're talking about in this context is someone who really combines the understanding of the business context with the understanding of the technology and the data uh, that you need in order to act upon it. Because the understanding of the business context allows you to interpret the patterns, allows you to make sense, and allows you to ask the right questions. And the tools allow you to get the answers to the questions. So much more important than getting the answers is knowing what questions to ask. And it's people like that that you need to, to sort of add into the organization and then build the culture of agility and experimentation. Uh, uh, to, to, to add on to what Mohan, Mohan just said, it, 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 it's a mix of, uh, 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 of, of capabilities uh, and, and, and types of, of, of people that you require in an organization. Uh, some already exist, some you might have to bring in, right? Uh, depending on how far advanced your, your company is with agility, for example, I found it very helpful over the years 
to hire, for example, an agile coach, uh, you know, somebody that helps organizations think through how their processes have to change in order to become incrementally more agile. Also very important to learn about where agility is the best choice and where agility is not the right choice. It is, it is an important realization for a company to know where to use best practices and where they don't work. You don't build a data center in Agile. You don't build a nuclear power plant in Agile. You don't build an airplane in Agile, right? There are certain things that require a high degree of, of governance and repeatability and where Agile might not be the right choice. But there's also a lot of exploration, especially when you deal with, with the unknown of data, with new data you haven't seen before. This is where Agile is really uh, shining and when, when, when enabled can really, can really help with that. Uh, on the other side, uh, I found it that uh, specifically out of cloud and out of DevOps thinking communities, you find interesting technologists that, that have learned how to deal with technology at scale and how to deal with concepts like continuous deployment, which is very different from the traditional IT thinking, right? When, 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 our, when, when we look inside our companies, IT processes usually start around the requirements document and they usually separate production from non-production. When I first approached teams of of, 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 from operations or sysadmins or DBAs and said, you know what, these platforms that we have for production, they also need to have 10, 20, 30, 50 percent of experimentation and non-production on it. The first initial reaction was like, well, not here, right? I mean, we're over our dead bodies. Uh, a production system that it cannot be that a marketing person creates tables on, on, a, uh, on a file system or a, a database that is marked as production. And, and this is an inherent change on how we need to deal with platforms and how to enable tools like uh, data labs where we say, no, no, absolutely, production, semi-production, non-production are just capabilities that need to live next to each other. And then you need to bring people in that are hungry and that are able to leverage this agility and leverage these platforms to not be afraid to ask new questions, right? At the same point in time, one of the things I've also learned over the years is like, just because you built these tools, uh, you can also not forget about the financial implications, about capacity planning implications and things like that. If you turn on something like Data Labs, you cannot do this on a platform that is 95% busy. Right? Because whoever comes to self-service and tries to do some analysis, if they have to wait for minutes or hours before they get any, anything back, they will run away from you. They will do something else, right? Uh, so it's important that to understand agility is something that, for example, is a, yeah, I mean, it needs to go even into the budget cycle, right? You need to, to, to think about that and you need to align the different business units and, and find your pilot customers within the company that are willing to work with that. And then, for some of the skills, yeah, you bring in some, some different thinking individuals, but on the other side, even more important is to educate the existing uh, workforce, to educate the existing teams of how they can get more done, right, in a more flexible environment that, however, doesn't slide away and become wild, wild west, where it's just like, oh, uh, we do daily stand-ups, but we stop doing documentation, we stop doing architecture, because that leads to non-repeatable processes, and so it is all about culture. It's all about finding the right mix, finding the change agents within the company that are willing to look at, at things from outside of the box with a very different approach, using best practices, and then ultimately educating the rest and enabling uh, data scientists, enabling DevOps, enabling cloud-like thinking to come into the data and be deployed at scale. Well, uh, Rich, if I could uh, proactively answer a question that seems to be thematically repeating uh, in two, three questions, it's, it's sort of the implications on the size of the workforce uh, and the shrinkage of the workforce and smaller teams. Um, and I will just uh, be honest here and say um, that, that this is true. We are going to need less people. Uh, and that, there is a dark side to... Uh, evolving the analytics capability and becoming a sentient enterprise because uh, at, you, you, you will need fewer people with higher order skills. And while the history of technology always suggested that the fears of 
you know, job replacement due to automation were overblown, and we found new ways to employ people. Uh, but this time around, uh, the shrinkage of the workforce or reskilling that is required may be a very real question, and, and I, for one, don't have an answer to the question of where we will find new jobs uh, for the people that are potentially going to be replaced by algorithms. So that is uh, something to keep in mind. Well, we're, we're nearing the end of our time. I want to ask, throw out a final question to both of you that comes from uh, somebody listening in. And do you think a collaborative approach also carries the risk of losing responsibility and thus not getting anywhere? That is the, the free rider problem. Would you suggest having topics owners or, or coaches? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll very quickly respond to this, that uh, in, in any crowdsourcing or collaborative approach, you also need to think about incentives. You need to think about, uh, you know, and, and the way that incentives have worked is that uh, there is a social recognition uh, of the most valuable contributors, uh, the people who are making the best contributions, they rise to the top. This even happens in the open source community, and this happens, uh, you know, on support forums. So organizations need to be careful to be able to create a reward system that is linked to the sort of social or reputational capital that people who make the greater contribution uh, so that are, are, are recognized and the community has to recognize that internally. Uh, that is a way to address the free rider problem. People may still get be able to free ride, but they but the ones who get recognized for their contributions by the community uh, need to be rewarded. Yeah, so the... the, 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 the the, the concept of gamification certainly plays a role here, right? Uh, how, how to incent the most active contributors, and, and as you said, I mean, uh, having having been active in open source communities, having seen the most active contributors rise to the top, uh, uh, it, it's an it's an interesting it's an interesting thing that happens uh, around the world. Having said, even inside of companies, right? I have not seen goals and and, and individual feedback go away just because we enable collaboration, quite the opposite. Uh, it might become uh, so that we can deliver faster, therefore we have, we have to accomplish more, right? But ultimately what I've seen happening at scale is that more often than not, people inherently want to work together. Inherently, they, they, even though if there are silos within an organization, more often than not, I found that individuals that have learned about other individuals in the company working on a similar problem, just by reaching out and saying, hey, what have you found there? How can we work together? Uh, you seem to be working on a similar problem. It's really, uh, it's really a satisfying experience for, for most individuals within an organization, and it also enables faster, uh, at scale, uh, 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 progress within the, within the company, which ultimately comes down to, to yeah, to, to more aggressive goals, to uh, all of a sudden, like, we're not trying to build just 15 new applications a year on our data platforms. All of a sudden, the goals are around how do we b take tens of thousands of hypotheses a year, build hundreds or more experiments, and find the five to ten ones that are most significant, game-changing things within the company. So, Again, this is why cultural change is ultimately important. Um, Technology is, while important, well, as I said before, while you need scale, while you need concurrency, while you need workload management, these are just, these are just a must-haves. But those alone don't do anything to the organization unless you change the culture of how you think and where agility and moving faster and collaboration becomes ingrained within a company and becomes the de facto standard of how you deal with data and how you deal with technology uh, uh, throughout the organization. Well, thank you very much, gentlemen. We, uh, we have come to the end of our time. We are unable to answer all the questions that were submitted, and there were many, but we will make sure that all questions that were submitted will receive a follow-up. If you'd like today's webinar, uh, review today's webinar at a later date, a recorded version will be sent to you via email this week. And once again, thank you, Mohan and Oliver, and thank all of you who listened in today for your participation. Thank you very much.